So, um, my name is Graham Roche. Um, I'm going to be doing a talk this morning on uh, Grails 3 and our thinking behind that and the direction of the framework. Uh, we'll do a review of what's new in uh, Grails 2.4, which uh, came out a couple of weeks ago and which we're equally excited about, um, and uh, open it up for any questions or you know feedback. We really um, are interested in engaging the community and the future direction of Grails 3, um, and conferences like this are like an ideal opportunity to to understand the areas that um, you guys would love to see improving and, and making sure the direction that we think we're going is, is the right one. So, um, uh, so the Q&A part, I hope, of this is going to be quite um, interesting, or uh, at least from my perspective. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Anyway, as I said on the, on the agenda today, we'll just do a little bit of a state of the nation. Uh, go over Grails 2.4 and 2.4.x. Uh, we'll talk about Grails 3, and then we'll do a Q summary Q&A. So, as I said, Grails 2.4, we released a couple of weeks ago. Um, and at the same time-ish, we released 2.3.9. Uh, 2.3.9 continues on the Groovy 2.1 line, and Grails 2.4 obviously has got the latest and greatest in out of Groovy. Um, there's been lo loads of bug fixes over the last um, three months. We've been trying to do uh, frequent releases of minor versions. So that's why you see uh, in 2.3.x we've got up to 2.3.9. And it might be the first time that we get to it a dot .10 version of Grails with 2.3.10. So um, we've been releasing quite frequently uh, the latest bug fixes on, on uh, each, uh, each, each branch. Um, the plugin community con continues to be really active. Um, it's now 1,100 plugins for Grails, and it still remains a super exciting area that we're really enthusiastic about, and um, you know, one of the unique selling points of Grails. So, um, it's great stuff still happening in that area. So, let's talk about Grails 2.4. So, who here has tried Grails 2.4 or installed it or had a look at it so far? A few hands. Who's using 2.3? A lot of hands, that's good. And 2.2? A few hands, yeah. Uh, 2.1? Okay. One, okay. We, uh, hey. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so it's good to see that most folks are moving their way up the um, 2.x line. Um, so what do you get in 2.4? So some important things. Um, there's this... Uh, Little thing called Java 8 that came out recently um, that uh, you may you may have heard about. Uh, so Groovy 2.3 supports Java 8. Group Grails uh, 2.4 ships with Groovy 2.3, so uh, you get Java 8 support. So if you want to run Grails in Java 8, um, Grails 2.4 is your friend. Um, there's also Spring 4. So uh, Grails 2.3 is still based on Spring 3.2. I think it is. Um, whilst Grails 2.4 shipped with Spring 4.0.5, so if you're after the latest um, innovations from the Spring uh, community in that area, especially you know, there are some interesting things around WebSocket, which we'll discuss um, shortly, uh, Grails 2.4 is your friend as well. Uh, we also have um, improved compile static support, uh, shift to the asset pipeline plugin. Uh, we modularized the code base. There's a bunch of Hibernate goodies and um, GORM and GSP standalone, which I'll talk about shortly. Okay, so um, let's talk about Spring 4 first. So Spring 4 um, uh, has some really has a bunch of uh, innovations around Java config and um, more Spring-centric features, but it's also got a lot of um, really interesting things that apply to the Groovy and Grails community. Uh, one of them is uh, Groovy Bean Definition Reader. So uh, <coughs> most of you have probably been exposed to resources.groovy uh, and um, the Beans definition and uh, Grails is Bean Builder DSL. Um, 
And we like that, don't we? We like the way we, you can define beans, XML free. Um, so now that all that capability is native to Spring, so there's a groovy bean definition reader in Spring 4, and you can define your whole application context and Spring configuration in Groovy if you uh, so choose. And it was a collaborative effort between the Grails team and the Spring team. Um, so it was ported from the implementation in Grails, so it's compatible with the implementation in Grails. And um, uh, it, it, it provides another option um, for those looking to stay away from XML when using Spring. There's also some really interesting support for uh, Spring WebSockets, uh, Spring uh, WebSockets in Spring uh, for um, and Socket SockJS. So, and <laughs> what's already emerged out of that is uh, with the great community that we have is there is a plugin for Spring WebSockets. So if you want to build WebSocket applications um, uh, ba based on the Spring WebSocket support um, for Grails that is now possible uh, via a plugin uh, which leverages all of the goodies from Spring 4. Um, so you can set up a SockJS client and, and talk over WebSockets um, in modern browsers uh, with Grails 2.4. Okay, <laughs> Groovy 2.3. Uh, there is those, I mean, I'm not going to go over again what Guillaume covered in great detail yesterday. We all know how, and, and how exciting in Groovy 2.3 is. Uh, there's a whole uh, catalog of release notes that all, of, all the great things that came on Groovy 2.3 in that link. Um, you know, but some of the exciting things, obviously, the traits, that's, that's really gr uh, groundbreaking stuff. Um, and uh, provides a solution that we've been trying to solve for a while um, in terms of uh, having a support for mixins um, that are composable, and um, so uh, traits are, are really great. Uh, we're really excited for them, and, and I think they're going to influence the direction of Grails three uh, in significant ways. So um, we're pretty excited about the support for traits in Groovy two point three, um, amongst other things. So great stuff. Uh, Groovy two point three, um, three point three point one ships with Grails two point four. And uh, we'll be shipping Rails 2.4.1 with Groovy 2.3.2 uh, very shortly. Um, so stay tuned in that area. So some other notable up updates to the various JAR dependencies or you know the dependencies of Rails. Obviously, as I said, there's the Java 8 support. So if you want to run uh, Rails on the latest uh, JDK from Oracle Java 8, um, you can do that now. But uh, Hibernate 4.3.5 is now the default version of Hibernate when you create new new applications in um, in Rails. Uh, I think it's time we moved on from Hibernate 3, finally. So um, uh, yeah, uh, Hibernate 4.3.5 is now your friend. Uh, we also upgraded to AspectJ 1.8. So if you're if you're using AspectJ, any kind of point cut definitions. In your Grails application, that was important because it supports Java 8. Um, uh, we removed the dependency resolution from uh, Sonotype. Um, uh, Ether is, a, is the dependency resolution engine from Maven. And in Grails, um, I think it was 2.3, we moved to, to Ether as the default dependency uh, resolver. Uh, but we used uh, Sonotype's uh, Ether implementation which was later contributed to Eclipse. So now it's a separate, independent, not related to Sonotype, Eclipse project maintained uh, under the Eclipse umbrella. Um, so we moved from Sonotype's pack ether to Eclipse ether. It's the same project, but um, it just cleaned up and made uh, Eclipse compatible. Um, and obviously the latest version is 0.9.2, whilst in um, in Grails 2.3, we were shipping an earlier version. We also have fewer overall dependencies. So if you are upgrading from 2.4, this is an area you may need to look at. Um, uh, Grails has less, fewer dependencies on external libraries than it did before. So the, notably, the various commons, hyphen, star libraries are no longer direct dependencies. So if you are upgrading, you may need to declare, and you are using those libraries, you may need to declare a dependency on them. Um, we've been trimming and making 
trimming grails down and reducing external dependencies. Um, so on that front, that's heavily related to the modularization effort. Um, so part, part of Grails, um, the work in Grails 2.4, which is kind of we've been preparing the groundwork for Grails 3, was modularization. So in Grails 2.3, um, in Grails 2.3, there was one big jar called Grails Web, and it had like pretty much everything in it. Um, that made um, <coughs> that made the web part of Grails work from GSP to the controller layer to everything. So we've been splitting that out, um, and uh, it's now six or seven submodules, um, nicely partitioned. Uh, Grails core as well. We split out validation. We split out um, what we call the project API, which is more com command line specific stuff, and that shouldn't really have been there in the first place. The encoding stuff we split out of the Grails core. So we've been splitting and modularizing Grails and separating and uh, really refining it, uh, reducing external dependencies, making it a lot easier um, to manage uh, refactoring. Mm. There's been a lot of uh, underlying improvements in Grails 2.4 that, um, that uh, long term uh, we will all benefit from. Okay, so uh, asset pipeline. So <coughs> um, in Grails 2.3 and below, we uh, we the resources plugin was used for um, uh, for asset management, static static assets, and so on. And although um, it was a, um, a good solution for, for a time, there was various problems with it the module definitions, the fact that there were separate Groovy files, the fact that it was something that uh, got involved at runtime rather than being a build time uh, thing. And a whole bunch of uh, reasons that you know are detailed in more depth on the wiki page there. But basically, um, the asset pipeline plugin uh, we feel is a superior solution to resources. And uh, this is acknowledgment of that and moving to it as the default. Um, plugin for managing static assets. There is full documentation at that link over there. Um, we have to extend our thanks to David Estes and uh, the <coughs> his, his team at uh, Bertram Capital, who have uh, worked tirelessly on making sure that the pipeline and plugin was ready for Grails 2.4. Um, it was a real collaborative effort, and uh, we, has, we appreciate his work in this area. Um, <coughs> but all the feedback we have has been uh, great regarding the plugin. So uh, folks are really happy with it and the, way it, the fact that it works really well with uh, things like CoffeeScript and less and so on and um, has been a, an important factor uh, in, in shifting to it. So we're excited about that. Um, and, uh, and we encourage people to, if you are using resources, to consider having a look at um, Asset Pipeline. Okay, so <coughs> standalone. Um, part of all that modularization effort that we went through, uh, a lot, uh, the, uh, some of the motivation from that was to make sure that um, pieces of Grails could be used outside of Grails, and that uh, we can start to see the fruition of that. So um, there is now it is now possible to use GORM for Hibernate for um, outside of Grails. So in the article that linked here, from here, you can see that um, uh, this is a, a, an example using, using Spring Boot. So I don't know if I can click that properly. Um, we encourage you to go and check out these guides. Oh, no internet, but anyway. Uh, the link's there. I'll post my presentation later. Um, there's guides on how to get GORM for Hibernate 4 and GORM for MongoDB up, up and running in a Spring Boot application. Note that um, the, it's not just Spring Boot. You can even boot spin up GORM inside a Groovy script that's completely independent of Grails. You can spin up GORM for Hibernate 4 or MongoDB in just a Groovy script. So we've designed it in a way that um, it's possible to use GORM completely independently of Grails, uh, which I think is pretty exciting. 
exciting and a, a feature that a lot of people have been asking for a, for, for a long time. Um, and I think a lot of people will enjoy that. Another thing is GSP. So currently we have an, uh, an RC uh, level uh, Spring Boot extension. So you can, you can essentially use GSP uh, in a Spring Boot application as well. Um, obviously there's a lot of tag libraries that are specific to Grail, so it's kind of a trimmed down version, but most of the core tags are there. And you can define new tag libraries and so on. Um, so I think uh, having GSP outside of Grails was one of the most um, voted for features in Algera, and it's nice to see that that's finally come, um, and that it's possible to use it in just a normal Spring ABC application. Um, so we're excited about that area as well. And, um, and we encourage feedback as well, so we, you know, if you folks are trying this out, um, using GORM or GSP outside of Grails, we'd like to know what your experiences are uh, with using those technologies independently of Grails, in addition to Grails itself. <coughs> okay, so um, I think it was uh, uh, Groovy 2 uh, originally, the way it was Groovy 2 or 2.1 Compile Static? Two. 2, yes. So the first version of Compile Static um, was introduced in Groovy 2 a while ago. And you could um, use it in a Grails application. However, there were various um, things you have to be aware of. For example, um, if you put compile static on your Grails code, whether it be a service, a service, or a controller, or something, or whatever it may be, if you then used any dynamic part of Grails. So you wanted to call a dynamic finder, for example, on a, on a, on a GORM domain class. You wanted to say book find by title. That um, compiles, Groovy's compile static was not aware of the dynamic finder, so you would get a compilation error. Uh, and we thought about this and we thought, hey, well, this is a shame that you have to make these exceptions and you have to kind of extract this bit out that calls the dynamic finder into a separate method that wasn't compile static. And it would be really nice if you know, the, the Groovy static compiler was just aware that Grails was there and that if it came into anything that was Grails specific to just say, hey, we know this is a dynamic finder. We understand what you're trying to do. We know you're in control and you're not going to do anything silly. So, um, <laughs> so um, just let it happen. And that's what Grails compile static is, basically. It, Groovy, uh, Groovy's um, static compilation has the ability to extend it by type checking extensions. And we have leveraged those in, um, in Grails, so that there is now a Grails compile static. And essentially, the Grails compile static version is um, Grails aware. So what that means is you can put it on a controller uh, or a service or whatever. And when you interact with the Grails framework, whether it be by GORM, dynamic finders, criteria, where queries, um, you won't get compilation areas in those areas. Um, it will allow those things while the rest of your code will be statically compiled, optimized, and dispatched, and so on. So um, we're also, this is also an area that we've not had much feedback on. Um, we've had a few Jira issues reported and we fixed those, uh, but we would love to, for folks to try this out and, um, and uh, because I have no doubt there are corners of the framework that, um, uh, that, that we could improve on in this area so that you could add uh, comp uh, compile static to more areas of, the, of your Grails applications. So um, we would love to hear um, feedback on this area, so those who are using uh, Grails 2.4, uh, let us know uh, how you get along with Grails Compile Static. <coughs> okay, so um, I'm going to go over some of the new Hibernate goodies that uh, we shipped in Grails 2.4, and there's quite a few of them that you should be um, aware of. So one of them is uh, Hibernate subqueries. 
So we had some support for subqueries in, in Grails 2.3 or earlier ver versions of Grails. Um, and notice, notice that because Hibernate is now a separate plugin, you can get these features in Grails 2.3 apps as well because we pulled Hibernate out as a plugin. All these features, you just add the latest version of the Hibernate plugin and you get all these features in 2.3 as well, or earlier. So, um, uh, but anyway, there's a number of new features in the latest version of GORM for Hibernate that um, I think are, are, are worth mentioning. Uh, so one of them is, is subqueries. Uh, so now we support um, in and not in subqueries that span domain classes. So, for example, I can create a WHERE query that says I want to find all my employees uh, that are in the APAC and EMEA region. Yeah, so that's a, an independent WHERE query. Notice when I, uh, you're probably already aware of this, but WHERE queries, they don't actually execute the query. They're just like a query definition. So that's, it's called a detached criteria instance. So I've got, well that, that employee's variable is a, is a detached criteria instance. And then I can create a separate WHERE query uh, down here, this on, this on a sale domain class, that references that employee's detached criteria. So I'm saying sale WHERE employee in employees, so in another query. So I'm doing a subquery um, to, ex to find all the employees within the APAC and EMEA region, and their salaries are greater than 50,000. Um, uh, the sale is greater than 50,000, sorry. Uh, and then we can execute that query. So you can see we've got two different queries referencing each other to form a, a subquery. Uh, and, and there is in, uh, so employee in employees, and there's also not in, um, uh, which you, you just essentially negate the expression. Uh, so if I put a negate, it becomes a not in query. So, um, so when I say negate the expression, you put it in parentheses with a uh, exclamation mark at the front. Okay, so um, you can also do correlated subqueries. So you'll notice that in this first query, uh, the the um, inner query, which is employees, is not referencing the outer query, which is on sale. Yeah. So correlated subqueries are where the inner query references the outer query. So in this example, um, I'm incorrect. I'm really good to have a pointer, actually. But anyway, I should have bought one. So um, in uh, in this query, I'm I'm creating a, an alias called EM1 in the second line there, and essentially that that's referencing the outer query, and then I'm using an exist. So I'm saying where um, uh, and then on the, I'm defining a second uh, uh, um, alias, def em2 equals employee, which references the employee association of sale. And I'm able to, I'm able to compare, uh, to correlate the two queries uh, by referencing the outer query. Thank you. I should have brought my own. You just press the button. Ah, oh. oh, yeah. So uh, you can see here I've got EM, uh, EM1. This is a reference to the outer query, yeah? And we're using some AST transformation magic, which is, which is what where queries are all about, to basically say that this is a reference to my outer query, just by defining a variable, yeah? Then I'm saying it exists and passing in another query here. And you notice that this inner query, which has a reference uh, to the employee association EM2 is able to do a, comp do a comparison with um, which is what's known as a correlated query to EM1. Yeah? So previously to accomplish these types of queries with Grails you would have to use some HQL or uh, criteria syntax, uh, raw Hibernate criteria syntax, very verbose in fact, I, I posted a, a GIST comparing uh, the Hibernate version, raw Hibernate version, versus this Grails version. And the Hibernate, raw Hibernate version was like 20 lines. And this is like, you know, five lines. Uh, not a very lo lo much code. So Hibernate correlated subqueries. 
pretty, uh, pretty neat stuff. So anyway, whenever you need to create an alias, you just need to know that uh, you, you just call def em1, and when you, what you def can either be the class, and that represents the, the, the current query, or an association of the class. So def em2 equals employee, which is an association of sale. I think it's a pretty natural syntax to express uh, quer uh, uh, into query references. Okay. Another interesting feature, which we actually forgot to add to the what's new, uh, so you're like kind of uh, getting a bit of extra information here to the what's in the what's new guide. Uh, probably we'll add it to the 2.4.1 what's new guide, but it's actually in 2.4, is, uh, <laughs> is um, column uh, readers and writers. So uh, previously, if you wanted to do anything um, uh, fancy at the database level to represent a particular property type, you had to use uh, custom Hibernate user types. Um, but this is a really simple way uh, to say, so whenever <coughs> uh, the title property is written to the database, convert it to upcase. I mean, this is a complete nonsense example. You would never do this, but um, uh, just for you know purposes. Of, uh, and whenever you read a uh, title from the database, actually, I have a little mistake. That should be title. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. So whenever you uh, read title from the data database, then repeat it twice. So. And that these two essentially get embedded in your SQL, yeah? So what you end up with is uh, custom logic that it will be an ability to customize what gets written and read uh, at the database level, yeah? So it's a pretty handy feature. Um, and it's, it avoids the need to create pretty complicated custom Hibernate user types um, unnecessarily. Okay, and something that's uh, something that is uh, in uh, the release notes for 2.4, but doesn't work exactly like we hoped it would, at least in 2.4. <laughs> um, but uh, it does work in 2.3.9, interestingly enough. But uh, there's little issue in 2.4, which we're fixing for 2.4.1. So I've marked this as uh, coming soon. Is you can essentially um, uh, use now uh, Hibernate in Hibernate 4 in your unit tests. So uh, if you have any kind of complex query logic that isn't really testable, uh, it's, it's, it's complex enough that you don't want, you're not comfortable testing it with Rails as a mocking and unit testing framework, you can now spin up Hibernate, and we recommend you do this in, in setup spec. So that the reason we recommend doing this in setup spec rather than setup is because it happens once for all the tests in your in your specification in your spec spec. Um, so when you use setup spec, it, it only sets up Hibernate once. And the good news is setting up Hibernate nowadays with Hibernate four is a lot faster than it used to be. So uh, Hibernate actually loads pretty pretty decently fast now nowadays, especially on modern hard hardware. So it's actually not that costly to spin up um, Hibernate in an in-memory database um, inside your unit tests. And of course, these are runnable inside your IDE and, and uh, unlike integration tests. Um, so um, again, they're just more, more comfortable if you're... Uh, uh, um, so uh, again, a nice, a nice feature uh, which we're hoping to refine in 2.4.1. Okay, so um, I'm, that was all of the features I'm covering that's kind of what's new in 2.4. I didn't want to move on without a special mention of GOM for MongoDB uh, because that was, again, GOM for MongoDB 3 was developed within the scope of 2.4. Um, so uh, quite a few new features uh, <coughs> were delivered in GOM for MongoDB 3. Um, we have support for MongoDB 2.6. Um, GeoJSON type support, uh, so you, we actually have value types for various GeoJSON types. So if you um, want to store various shapes um, 
and then query the, how those shapes intersect and overlap. And we have that right now. Um, you can represent maps of entities. Uh, we have support for full text search, which is quite handy because uh, you can in MongoDB 2.6, you can essentially do a lot of what the searchable plugin does. Uh, by representing, by indexing a field as a full text search field, and then uh, there's a new search method on domain classes, and you can perform searches, wildcards, and all sorts of things. So, quite handy. Um, we also support now projections. So, all the different projections of GORM, max, min, average, etc., uh, work uh, as you would expect, um, and they use the MongoDB aggregation framework underneath the covers. Um, we support size queries on collections, so the various uh, size equals, size less than um, uh, style queries on collections work now in MongoDB. And as I, as I mentioned before, you can run it in, uh, outside of Grails in, um, in a Spring Boot application independently. So that was kind of released uh, more or less um, a couple of weeks before, but essentially uh, developed at the same time as Grails 2.4. And another special mention uh, goes out to the 2.4 version of the Maven plugin. <coughs> the reason this is, gets a special mention is because the uh, 2.4 version of the Maven plugin has uh, maybe been significantly improved. Um, we upgraded to Maven 3.1 plus, so, that, so that's now the minimum version of Maven to use it. Um, it's been rewritten to use Ether, uh, as recommended by the Maven develop plugin development guide. So Ether is used to resolve dependencies within the plugin itself. Um, and, uh, and the good news as well is that you can now use it with different versions of, of Grails. So we don't anticipate from now going forward that there will be a new Maven plugin for each Grails release. Uh, they will now separate their, it used to be that every time Make Grails was released you'd get a new Maven plugin. Now we anticipate that, that will, that's not going to happen going forward. Uh, 2.4 I don't think will be at the last release of the Maven plugin, but um, it's not going to be that there's going to be a new Maven plugin each time a new version of Grails comes out. The reason being is that you can actually use the new Maven plugin to build any version of Grails. Uh, so I can actually say in my, in my POM that my app is a 2.3.8 app, even though I'm using the 2.4 Maven plugin, and uh, it will build the 2.3.8 um, app in Maven. So if you're a Maven user, and uh, we still have a few of those holding on, on uh, then uh, you'll appreciate the new Maven plugin. Okay. So, uh, some things that we are uh, still working on and anticipate uh, releasing over the next uh, couple of months. Um, that's uh, around 2.4. So, 2.4.1, uh, we anticipate will be out very soon, if not next week, then shortly after, thereafter. thereafter. Um, there's also the Spring Security Core plugin, uh, which we are is at the RC stage. Uh, there's a few open blockers, and we are hoping to work through those and release a 2.0 uh, GA version of Spring Security Core uh, very soon. Um, the, two, the Spring Webflow plugin is not currently compatible with 2.4 because um, the versions of Spring are incompatible so, uh, with the current release. So we will be releasing an update that just updates the Webflow plugin to the latest version of Spring Webflow and aligns it with Spring 4. Um, and that will be coming very shortly. And uh, you know, we, we plan to carry on iterating with bug fixes like we have been. So there will be a 2.4.1, a 2.4.2, a 2.4.3 uh, based on feedback from the community. So uh, we look forward to that feedback. Excellent. Okay, uh, any questions around Grails 2.4? Until I move on. No. Okay, let's go to talk about Grails 3. So, some of the goals for Grails 3 then. 
and some of the things we're thinking about uh, around Rails 3. So uh, one of the things is, obviously, our build system sucks. Um, and uh, current build system. So, and we've known that for a while, but it's gotten us this far. Um, but there's better solutions out there. Um, and we plan to embrace Gradle and make, sh and make sure that the Gradle experience is great in Grail 3. Um, we want to um, also abstract um, packaging and deployment um, so that uh, you don't necessarily have to bring, build a wall file. It could be a, a runnable jar. Um, uh, but, you, know, uh, uh, you may not necessarily be, uh, be deploying to a servlet container. Um, so that, to support that, we want to introduce for the notion of what we're calling application profiles. So these are, we want to be extensible. So we imagine that we will uh, we'll release Grail 3 with one or two profiles, but, that, but that, that as the life cycle of Grail 3 continues, we'll get um, more and more profiles um, uh, for Grails apps that allow it to run in different environments, whether it be uh, Netty or, or, or ser the normal servlet environment or Batch or Hadoop Yarn or um, there's a whole bunch of different uh, deployment targets that we are considering. Um, we, wanna, we want to simplify deployment so that it's just, uh, you, it, that you can just deploy with Grails itself or, or just run a jar file with Java slash jar, you know, my jar, and it runs uh, without needing to, you know, spin up a server container or anything. And to really extend the reach of Grails, um, far beyond where, to where it is now. Um, we're going to build Grail 3 on Spring Boot. Um, so the core foundation of Grail 3 will be powered by Spring Boot. Um, the plugin system will be looked at so that um, it becomes more event-driven. Uh, and, and we're looking at various ways um, to improve that area. Um, Startup time is something we really, really want to want to improve, uh, so that um, the plugin system configures itself more via events la and lazily. Um, so uh, again, it's the, the whole plugin system is under review, uh, but plugins are, are certainly going to be a key part of Grails three of what we're going, uh, how we're, we're taking it forward. We want to support multi-project builds, so. You should be able to compose your application using a Gradle multi-project build with multiple sub-projects ma making up your final, um, final ap application. Uh, we want to support microservices, so you, you should be able to um, deploy Grails, small Grails apps that aren't necessarily the full uh, monolith. Um, we want to remove bloat, uh, slim things down, reduce dependencies, um, and, and make it a lot a, a more refined experience than it is now. Um, so the, one of the things that we want, we're going to have to do to achieve that is to, uh, is to delineate the plugin system. So currently, when you think of a Grails plugin, it essentially spans, a single Grails plugin expands the, these three areas, code gen, build time, and runtime. And so, so, this, this has caused us problems. Um, if you think of something like the Quartz plugin, um, it, it has Cogen facilities in it for creating jobs and, and doing things. It also has build time stuff in it for testing and <coughs> various other bits. And then it also has runtime stuff in it. <coughs> and that single package that spans these three areas has caused us all manner of problems. It's very convenient. I admit, to be able to just say, you know, add this plugin and the whole thing is configured and works. But um, it, also, it also comes with a cost. Um, so we plan to be delineating these things. And whether we, whether we then have a, a, um, a super artifact that then unifies those things again to, together, uh, those things again together, that might be the case, so that there's a thing, single thing that you can depend on that pulls in these three, 
but fundamentally the architecture of the new plugin, plugin system will be such that it is no longer possible to build one bucket plugin that, that spans all those things. Either it will be a runtime, a build time, or a code gen, a, ru a runtime, a build time, or a code gen plugin, and there will be separate physical things um, so that we can um, make sure that uh, the whole thing hangs together a lot better than it does now. Uh, so, with, so with Grails 3 and Gradle, we plan to deprecate the existing build system. Um, there, may, there will likely still be a way to instrument the old build system so that you can run uh, legacy plugins. Um, but uh, we haven't decided whether that, that will uh, definitely be the case. Um, we, it's going to be easier to do because everything now in Grails is forked. You know, we did a lot of groundwork to make sure that when you run an application, it's forked into a separate JVM, or when you run the test, it's forked into a separate JVM. So it, it's going to be a lot easier for, 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 um, to, to achieve the move to Gradle now that that's done. But the great thing about having Gradle about, um, is it's an extremely powerful build system. And it's got a very active um, community around Gradle plugins and extensions. So, although you know something like we don't we the, so, something like the code coverage plugin for Grails will not work in Grails three, um, you'll be able to use the the Gradle code coverage plugin or you know the, the Gradle ecosystem plugins that make it great or the Gradle find bugs plugin or the Gradle. So there'll be a whole bunch of um, um, uh, replacement and probably better in, in the area of build system t plugins. Um, also, uh, you can do stuff with Gradle that just makes it, you know, we want, we want to be able to, you should be able to run your, your tests in parallel like Gradle allows you to do. You should be able to create incremental builds like Gradle allows you to do. Um, and plugins will still be able to uh, provide Gradle extensions. So we're, we're looking at um, that area in detail. We also want to allow, we also think there's a place in the world for both micro and monolith applications. So we want to be able to, Gradle to be able to power that so that you can either build the micro uh, framework style or you can build the monolith um, by multi-project plugin architectures is what we call them. So Gradle, you define your project in a multi-project level, you can run only a single project if you want to, or you can run the whole thing if you want to, and reloading works and across, across all subject projects, and it just works. You can import it into an IDE, and um, with Gradle tooling, uh, or you can run the whole thing as a whole, and it just works via Gradle's uh, multi-project support. So we're, we're super excited about the, uh, this area and, um, and making this uh, a compelling uh, reason to use Grails 3. So, uh, Spring Boot. Uh, Grails 3 will be built on Spring Boot. Uh, this was an easy decision to make. Boodle, Boot handles a whole bunch of stuff that we can just defer to it, including embedding of servers, runnable, creating runnable jar files, packaging wall files, scripting and microservices. It was really a no-brainer to do this. Um, and uh, and we're pretty excited uh, of the possibilities of what we can do. So one of the nice things that you can do with Boots is like microservices. So here's a an example of you know, maybe something that, you, that we'll be able to achieve. Uh, so this is a, um, uh, this is a REST resource, so it's a domain class. We have our uh, H2 database up here and it maps to that URI. So it wouldn't be nice if you could just have that as a boot microservice, yeah? So um, <clears throat> let's see if we can do that. There it is. So now if we do uh, spring run app.groovy, let's see if we can get our first Grail 3 app up and running. Okay, so as you can see, powered by Spring Boot. Um, as I said, one of the areas we really want to optimize is startup time. But um, we have our Grails up and running, Grails up, 
starting up. And what we can do now is if we can go to another window, just hit our URI. There it is. And then so we have a Grails app up and running. So in essentially uh, eight lines of code, we have a microservice. Yeah? So imagine you can just define one file with your domain classes and your resources and run it. And you have boot powered microservices, well, boot and Grails powered microservices. Yeah? So um, let's have a play around with this just to be, as, be as sure that um, I'm not lying to you here. Um, so I'm going to send a post request uh, with, uh, with a header that says content type. Then I'm going to spend some data. And I'm going to say title stand. Uh, sorry? My JSON is wrong. Ah, yeah, yeah, you're right. Thank you, somebody's awake this morning. It's good that you worked on all that JSON stuff in Groovy, you know. <laughs> Came in handy in the end. Okay, so I get something back saying that it's been created. And then if I go to there, get my book back. Uh, not found. Uh, probably because I need. Um, to send a set. Ah, that's that's H, yes. Oh, was it number two? Probably. Okay, so um, there you go. So essentially, we have a, a working RESTful web service in essentially an eight-line Groovy script. Yeah. So obviously, you know, this is a kind of proof of concept uh, idea of where we're going with what you could be able to achieve in Grails three with Spring Boot. But it's pretty cool that we be able to do things like. We want to be able to, to achieve so that you can, you can if you want to spin up a little microservice in eight, eight lines of Groovy, uh, you can do that with Grails 3. Or if you want to have a multi-project Gradle build with a really complex application, uh, you know, we want to so solve a range of different cases. And I th I, we strongly believe that with the combination of Gradle, Spring Boot, and Grails, we'll be able to build compelling solutions. Okay. So, um, so let's talk a bit, bit about uh, Grails application profiles. So each each profile, uh, we imagine having like distinct uh, distinct plugins, runtimes, and packaging. So when you create a new Grails application, you you would feed it a profile, and there would be a default profile, and <coughs> the package command will behave differently. It'll create a, create a runnable jar instead. Or if it was a yarn app, um, you know, for Hadoop, or if it, you know, depending what you what profile you used, um, you would create a different kind of application. Uh, so packaging would be abstracted. Um, the profiles themselves would be exposed uh, to plugins, their structure by an API. So a plugin will be able to introspect a profile and and figure out, you know, where shall I put controllers if I create them? Is, is it even allowed to create controllers? Um, so plugins will be able to support different kinds of profiles, multiple profiles or single profiles. Um, you'll have profile-specific commands. 
Um, so run package test will be specific to a particular application profile. You'll have profile specific plugins and profile specific, specific project templates. So if you create a new, new project, you get a specific type of project structure. But also when you, when you create a new controller or a new service, those templates for the individual files might be, would be different across, could potentially be different across each profile. And we anticipate there being both community maintained profiles, kind of like plugins, but also the core profiles that we ship with. Uh, we don't anticipate being able to maintain every single different kind of profile that, 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 that they could be. But, uh, <coughs> but, you know, if somebody comes along and says, hey, we want to be able to create a profile that lets you develop, uh, I don't know, Vertex or, you know, something or you know, applications with GORM or whatever, you know, that, that, that seems like something we'd, we'd like to encourage. There's also a lot of stuff that's going to be for the chopping block. So there'll be no server 2.5 support. Um, web, web, web XML is going away. Everything will be done by a pro programmatic servlet 3 um, configuration. Gantt in the current build system is going. Uh, GDoc will be replaced by ASCII doctor. Integration tests uh, with, with, uh, with things like the Hibernate test mixing and the stuff that we can do around the new test runtime stuff in Grails 2.4, uh, we feel that we can do everything that we need to do just in, within normal Spock specifications and unit tests that are runnable from your IDE, and thus reducing the reliance on the Grails command line to run all kinds of tests. Certain types of plugins like converters and codecs and so on, we feel uh, can be replaced by Groovy extensions instead of motor programming that we do, we do now. And filters will repl be replaced by a new mechanism that is easier to test. Um, and easier to compile static as well. Okay, so um, so what challenges do we face? Compatibility. Um, there is going to be uh, it's going to be a challenge to support our existing 1,100 plugin ecosystem. Um, <coughs> but we want to make sure that it, although um, the uh, Grails three provide is a completely new framework in terms of the design that that it's easy to migrate existing plugins to Grails 3. So we don't anticipate enforcing a whole lot of changes, particularly with plugins that do stuff purely at runtime. Um, so things like the Quartz plugin and uh, a lot of the plugins should just work, um, although um, probably in binary format. So. Um, uh, so there, there, there is going to be, it's not going to be the case that you'll be able to drop any 2.x plugin into a Grails 3 app and it'll just work, but <coughs> the path in order to upgrade a plugin and make it Grails 3 compatible will not be a big jump, we don't anticipate. Um, there's also a whole bunch of modularization work that still needs to happen, so a lot of, uh, um, uh, we plan to rename all the packages, so org.codehouse will go away and become org.grails. Um, we plan to introduce abstractions over the servlet API. There's going to be a lot of refactoring. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a lot of serious challenges in front of us that, uh, that, uh, that we face, but we, we're hoping that it, the community evolves with us. With us. And uh, we think that uh, we're going to get folks excited enough about Grails 3 that the plugin community will involve, evolve with us. So, that is my talk. Uh, we got time, a little bit, I think, for questions. Any questions on Grails 3? Yep, yeah, at the front. No, we I didn't say we would just use the Hibernate mix, and I anticipate replacing it. So there, there will be mixins where you're about to spin up your whole application, if needed. Um, 
but uh, we don't we we don't like the fact that um, currently integration tests most IDEs they have to delegate to the Grails command line to run them. Uh, you should be able to run a, a test in an IDE without having to do anything Grail specific. Um, so. We, we're not going to just rip out integration tests without there being a, a way to do what you did before. So there will be a, a, a way to spin up your entire application in a test. Um, we just don't anticipate uh, there being a test slash integration directory. Yes, uh, Servlet 3 API has a programmatic API for, um, for uh, defining filters. And, um, and, sp and, one of the, uh, and also um, Spring Boot has some nice extensions to that which allows you to order filters, define priorities and so on. So it actually in, in Grails 3 in master branch at the moment, the way you add a filter is just to add it as a Spring Bean and it gets automatically registered. Uh, if you then want to change the ordering, you can specify an order, implements orderable, and then, and then uh, boot will automatically order them based on the presence of other filters. Um, so there is a way, uh, it's just not gumping an XML file. Okay. Okay, thank you very much.